In this month of September, alluding to Mexico's national month and coinciding with the celebration of the new year in Ethiopia, we will talk about the origin and development of the relationship between both nations. Join us to unveil this fascinating history full of honor and truly impactful lessons. We should approach history throughout a deep analysis of the specific situation of each country, but also considering the principles that govern them as societies as well as their leaders. All of us, both nations and individuals, are capable of doing anything. The difference lies in the limits we set for ourselves. These limits arise from what we call values, and it is this that ultimately manifest in our actions. Today, we will see how the values that represent in their nations make history for some characters, whether throughout their crimes or historical deeds. We will also explore how two countries, virtually not existent in each other's awareness, ended up becoming close-knit siblings, discovering a multitude of overlapping affinities in their cultures. On June 29, 1882, in Atlajomulco, state of Mexico, a boy was born who would year later become a key figure not only for Mexico's role in the international community, but also for global survival and peaceful relations between nations. Don Isidro Favela grew up on an hacienda during the Porfiriato era. Although his family was relatively well off compared to the bulk of the society at the time, he grew up witnessing first-hand rural life and social inequalities. This led him to join to the Carrancista movement during the Mexican Revolution, participate in the promulgation of a new constitution, and alongside close friends like Jose Vasconcelos, forge a new Mexican identity after the revolution. Being a fervent admirer of culture and reading, he quickly delved into international politics. Throughout his life, he held multiple positions around the world, ranging from Secretary of Foreign Affairs to Plenipotentiary Ambassador in various countries. He was appointed on February 11, in 1937, as Mexico's permanent delegate to the League of Nations and was sent to Geneva. From his personal conviction and under the mandate of Mexican government led by General Lázaro Cárdenas, Don Isidro Favela championed the principles of sovereignty and non-intervention in nations, appealing to the basic tenet of the Estrada Doctrine, the non-intervention and the self-determination of peoples. In this arena, he spoke out against the Japanese invasion of China during the Manchurian conflict, defended Spanish refugees during the Civil War, and opened Mexico's doors so that thousands of children could find a second home in the country. He even adopted two Spanish children. He was also an early voice warning the world about the dangers of Germany's expansion into Austria. And the topic that brings us to this video today, he appealed for Italy's non-intervention in Abyssinia, which we will later know as the Ethiopian Empire. From the moment of his arrival, he saw very clearly the lack of leadership by the League of Nations in addressing international problems. From the war in Manchuria to various conflicts in the Middle East and Europe, he condemned it and warned it that remaining in a comfortable position, as strong powers did by merely observing and waiting up for the crisis to pass while making minor actions that simulate justice, will inevitably lead the war to a great disaster. Almost prophetically, he was proven correct when the Axis powers rapidly and uncontrollably expanded during the World War II. On July 23, 1892, in Mijersagoro, in the kingdom of Abyssinia, Efri Makonen was born, who we will later come to know as Kedemawi Negusu Negust Haile Selassie another major figure not just in the history of Ethiopia, but in the entire world. A fervent defender of diplomacy and progress for the benefit of humanity rather than war. His Majesty, Haile Selassie, in a faltering world and with a Europe eager of natural resources, 
will ascend to the throne in 1930. In 1931, Ethiopia joined it to the founding countries of League of Nations, and by 1936, he will be forced into exile, seeking the support of a League of Nations that, in theory, have been founded to prevent tragedies like that one the Ethiopian people were suffering at the hands of Mussolini. Throughout his life, we will see him support African independence, founding the Organization of African Unity, being the first country recognizing the independence of most African nations, and even offering asylum and training to leaders like Nelson Mandela. In 1936, Italy will invade Ethiopia, deploying its ice force and bombing villages, rivers, and forests with mustard gas. The indiscriminate use of chemical weapons have one aim for the fascists, to capture Ethiopia, but without Ethiopians. On June 30, in 1936, Emperor Haile Selassie addresses the Assembly of League of Nations in Geneva with the following speech. I, Haile Selassie I, Emperor of Ethiopia, am here today to claim the justice and its due to my people and the assistance promised to us eight months ago, when 50 nations affirmed that an act of aggression had occurred in violation of the international treaties. There is no precedent from a head of state personally addressing this assembly but neither is there a precedent for a people who have been victims of such injustice and who currently face being abandoned to their aggressors. Nor has there even before been an example of a government proceeding with the systematic extermination of a nation through barbaric means, in violation of the most solemn promises made by the nation of the earth, that the terrible poison of toxic gases will not be used against unison human beings. The leader of the Ethiopian Empire has come to Geneva to defend a people who are fighting for the age-old independence, fulfilling his highest duty, having himself fought at the front lines of his armies. I pray to all my God to spare nations the terrible sufferings that have been inflicted upon my people, of which the chiefs accompanying me have been horrified witnesses. It's my duty to inform the governments assembled in Geneva, being responsible like them for the lives of millions of men, women, and children, of the mortal danger that threatens them, for which I will describe the fate that has befallen Ethiopia. Italy has not only fought against warriors, but above all, has attacked populations far removed from hostilities in order to terrorize and exterminate them. What has become of the promises made to me in October 1935? I observe with pain, but with no surprise, that three powers have considered that the promises they made, compelled by the covenant, had no value at all. Their relations with Italy led them to reject the adoption of any sort of measures to hold the Italian aggression. On the contrary, it was a profound disappointment for me to discover the attitude of certain government which, while professing to scrupulously uphold the covenant, has seriously employed all its efforts to prevent its enforcement. As soon as a measure was proposed that could be immediately effective, various pretexts were found to postpone even its consideration. The Ethiopian government never expected other governments to shed the blood of their soldiers to defend the covenant when their own immediate interests were not at stake. Ethiopian warriors merely asked for the means to defend themselves. On many occasions, I have requested financial assistance to purchase of arms, and that assistance has been constantly denied to me. What then does the Article 16 of the Covenant regarding to collective security means in practice? Apart from the Kingdom of the Lord, there is no nation on this earth that is superior to any other. If it happens that a strong government finds it can destroy a weak people with impunity, then the time has come for that weak people to turn to the League of Nations to give their view in complete freedom. God and the history will remember your judgment. This speech was a critical moment not only in the history of Ethiopia, 
but also in the international stage, as it exposed the impotence of the League of Nations in stopping aggression and protecting the sovereignty of its weaker members. Haile Selassie became a symbol of resistance against imperialism and oppression, and his call for justice continued to resonate to date as a reminder of the importance of upholding the principles of international law and human dignity. Sadly, but in line with its own values and interests, the League of Nations merely pretend to support Ethiopia by agreeing to a series of sanctions against Italy, sanctions that were never carried out due to the other agreements signings between Powers and Mussolini. By the end of the same year, the same organization officially annexed Ethiopia to Italy, thereby allowing Italian troops to enter to Addis Abeba without any resistance. In 1937, Italy requested that Ethiopia be removed from the League of Nations. Although the request was denied on a technically, Ethiopia was gradually omitted from the institution's official documents. Mussolini didn't want to remove Ethiopia from the League of Nations. He wanted to erase Ethiopia from the earth. In the dictator's own words, he wanted Ethiopia without Ethiopians. Here, in a masterful move that is scarcely documented, but no thanks to the stories our grandparents have told us over the years, Don Isidro Favela, newly arriving in Geneva and witnessing such a mockery of the League of Nations Charter, as well as the nation indifference to our Ethiopian crisis, went so far to stand up in his seat to raise his voice and question the existence and authority of the organization. What is the point of a League of Nations if you all just sit here watching countries be destroyed and human life exterminated? Mexico, in itself a awareness as a vulnerable nation, could not allow others to be left to the mercy of imperialist inclemency and the power of those who consider themselves stronger. From that point on, Don Isidro Favela managed to organize some demonstrations in Mexico City, as well as other cities around the world against the Italian invasion in Ethiopia. Moreover, Mexico called for non-intervention was strong enough that eventually both the United States and England supported Emperor Haile Selassie in liberating his people from the fascist joke, not only with weapons, but also with troops. The story wasn't simple, nor it end as a bed of roses, it was undoubtedly an entire odyssey, but eventually Ethiopia regained its independence. Subsequently, Eritrea, which became part of the empire, and also Somalia, were freed from the Italian cruelty. On May 5, 1941, an ironic and significant wink of history, given what this date will mean for both nations, Emperor Haile Selassie triumphantly re-enters the capital Addis Abeba. Mexico's gestures toward Ethiopia will never be forgotten. Although sadly in the Aztec nation is something known by only a handful of people or some Ethiopian Mexican families, today, if a Mexican reveals their nationality or for some reason shows their passport with a national emblem, they will be warmly welcomed by their Ethiopian brothers and sisters, who to this day have not forgotten the gesture of justice to art or people. This dark chapter in history show how international institutions can fail in their mission to protect sovereignty and human rights. It serves as a reminder of the importance of strengthening global justice and accountability systems to prevent similar tragedies from occurring in the future. The League of Nations will dissolve it after its resounding and evident failure at the onset of World War II. In 1945, the United Nations was formed, with Ethiopia once again as a founding member. And this time, Mexico will also participate in the creation of this new organization. 
In 1954, Emperor Haile Selassie will visit Mexico, establishing a permanent home in Cuernavaca. Failing in love with this vibrant land full of culture and magic, this allowed several generations of Ethiopians to also be dazzled Among them, I can highlight my grandfather, engineer Wendy Frauasrat, who studied civil engineering at the National Polytechnic Institute. Many other important figures in Ethiopian history also did so, including the former Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Hailu Yemano, who earned a degree in agriculture engineering from the National Agrarian University of Chapingo. Ministers of Health, generals, and researchers in agrarian development were also among those who studied in Mexico. Mexico and Ethiopia will establish a somewhat complex relationship due to the physical distance, but one that is enduring due to the shared affinities and common interests. Over time, like two siblings whose paths diverge as they grow, they drift apart a bit but maintaining a residual and ever-present affection for each other. In September 1985, Mexico suffered one of the greatest tragedies in their recent history when an earthquake shook Mexico City, causing incalculable damage. Ethiopia, in the midst of a socialist revolution and still grappling with the ravage of droughts and multiple crises across its territory, collected $5,000 as a good sibling would and sent it to Mexico for aid. It wasn't much money, but it was more value for the significant effort it took for them to rise it and make their own turmoil. Relations cooled as both countries progressed in their historical journey towards a series of changes in their democracies and economic policies. In 1989, Mexico would close its embassy in Addis Ababa due to economic reasons, and Ethiopia will follow suit in 1990. It wasn't until 2007 that the government of then-President Felipe Calderón, recognizing a rapidly changing world and an Africa's growing importance in the geopolitical stage, decided to reopen the Mexican embassy in Addis Ababa. The same year, Mexico will also open embassies in the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, and Nigeria, as well as 18 more consulates in countries like Kenya and Angola. In 2010, as part of the celebration of the Bicentennial of Independence and the Centennial of the Mexican Revolution, Mexico donated a replica of an Olmec head to the Ethiopian government. This was installed in Mexico Square in Addis Ababa. Coincidentally, this square, like its counterpart in Mexico City, will become a metro station named the Mexico Station, another historical wink between the two nations. In July 2010, Ethiopian Prime Minister Mela Zanawi arrived in Cancun to attend the 2010 United Nations Climate Change Conference, the COP16. In June 2012, Prime Minister Mela Zanawi returned to Mexico to participate in the G20 summit in Los Cabos. In 2015, Quevere was established as the first Ethiopian Mexican restaurant aiming to promote the culture of both countries. In 2017, in a significant advancement, Ethiopian Airlines launched cargo services between the two nations. We hope that in the near future, interest between the two governments will grow sufficiently to take the next leap and create a direct passenger route between the two countries. Also, in 2017, in the city of San Luis Potosí, received a diplomatic visit from ministers of the Ethiopian government. This opened the possibility for learning and cooperation between the two nations on various topics such as science, trade, and academic collaboration. In 2019, both nations celebrated 70 years of diplomatic relations. As part of the festivities, Mexico released a special edition of lottery ticket. Today, the similarities are many, ranging from a very similar population size the importance of both in their respective regions, cultural overlaps, as well as assured challenges and opportunities. For Mexican society, Africa and Ethiopia are largely a mystery. It must be said, stereotypes and misinformation 
dominate the collective consciousness. However, gradually, throughout the increasingly frequent interactions with our brothers and sisters from countries like Kenya, Mali, Nigeria, Angola, among others, Mexican society is becoming more acquainted with the cultural diversity that unites us across both sides of the ocean. Quevedo is born precisely from this fascinating relationship. It comes from the pride of being literally the children of the history between Mexico and Ethiopia. Quevedo means my honor, and for us, it's an honor to share a culture on both sides. It's an honor to help improve cooperation and development between siblings who often have more in common than they are aware of. There is an exciting future that can be built in trade, in tourism, in science and technology, in spirituality, in learning from each other's history, culture or people and so much more. Quevere has been evolving. We started by offering you food and while staying true to our original mission of sharing culture, we are transforming into a platform to connect both regions. Many more surprises and projects that we are preparing are yet to come. So if you are interested in visiting Ethiopia or discovering the opportunities that Africa has for you, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, leave us a like, your comment and help us sharing this video. For us, it's a pleasure, an honor and always a joy to share with you. Thank you very much and see you next week.